lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you and glorify your holy name. You are truly worthy to be praised. We thank you that our Savior lives and that he's coming again. Lord God, we give you praise and glory and thanks for all things tonight. We thank you for bringing each one of us out here. We thank you for those that are watching online. We ask for your healing touch for any that are sick out there, Lord. We pray that you would heal them and raise them up. Lord, help us tonight as we study your word to dig into your word and learn more about you that we might grow closer to you. And, and Lord, I thank you. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for our Savior. And Lord God, I ask that in all things tonight you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, praise God. Thank you guys for singing. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Well, yes, we praise the Lord for them going, going back home or scheduled to go back home. I don't know if Patty is home yet. Yes. She's home. Okay. So praise the Lord. Yes. So answers to prayer. Well, tonight we're going to continue to talk about grace. And uh, tonight we're going to ask, a, I'm going to ask a question, grace, yeah, who's it for? That's going to be the question tonight. That's what we're going to take a look at. So grace, the question is, who's it for? And so we'll, we'll in investigate what the Word says about that. So, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we'll, we'll start there. If you remember last week, we were in Ephesians. All right. Ephesians chapter 2, starting verse uh, 8. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9. This is our base scripture here for the night. The core verse is, For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We talked about this last week and, and pretty extensively, and we'll continue talking about this, about grace. We understand that grace, uh, by grace you're saved. It is through faith. It is not of yourselves. It's nothing that you can do of your own ability to save yourself. It is God who does the saving. It is he, he is the one who gives. It is, right here it says that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The reason that it is the gift of God to us, this is, the reason that grace works like that is for one reason, because man, if it were in man's ability to save himself through his own efforts, he would boast about it. He would be prideful about it. He would be arrogant about it because this is what's in the heart of mankind. There's not things in the heart of mankind that please God. There are things in the heart of mankind that displease God. This is why your heart has to be changed. Basically, you have to get a spiritual heart transplant. You have to, have, you, you have to become a brand new creature in Christ. The old you is not, not going to work. And then the new you is new you because of him, not because of you. Does that make sense? See, when you, when you start putting it on yourself, like, I've done this and I've done that and I've done this, then guess what? That's pride. It does, that doesn't work. And anything that you have or anything that you are is because of him anyway. I mean, you're only here because of him. He made you. You didn't make yourself. Right? So this is what grace teaches us a lot about, uh, a lot about that. But who's it for? I mean, we see that for by grace you're saved through, through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're going to go over to Romans chapter 3. Good morning. Afternoon. Evening. Depends on where you're at, I guess. <laughs> Romans 3, starting at verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9. Amen. And tonight we're talking about grace and who's it for. It says here, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we, ha for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. 
They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's, it's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. He, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uns and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. You see, when I asked the question first, grace, who is it for? You know, for by grace you're saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Who is, who is it for? It's for Jew and Gentile. It's for all of us. You see, this God, he, he said, whosoever will, let him come, right? He, the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. We, we come to repentance because his offer is available and on the table for all mankind. God is just. He also knows who will turn to him. He knows from before he made anything who would turn to him and put faith in Jesus Christ and who would not. He knows that already. And yet his grace comes upon all mankind. His, his mercies are, are new every morning to all mankind. He gives, us, he gives us life. He gives us breath. He gives us food. He gives us a place to live. He gives all mankind this, even though there's a portion of mankind that will never turn to him, never put faith in Jesus. Even though he knows that, he still exhibits his great love, his great forbearance, his great mercy to all mankind. He's a good God. He's good. And this is why one of the things is, is we look at this, it says, you know, there's, there's no differentiation here. In verse 9, it says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. All of us are under sin. All of us need Jesus. All of us have to be born again. This is, there's no differentiation there. Yes, the Jews are God's chosen people. And yet they still needed to come through the Messiah. They still needed to turn to him and they rejected him. And so God took to the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous, right? And there will be a time that the times of the Gentiles will be over. Our job will be done. And God will turn his attention back once again to his chosen people to bring them to him. And he will. But there is a time of suffering coming for sure. And that's what happened when they rejected the Savior. But the condition of mankind is spelled out here, starting at verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who's, who is, is righteous on their own. There's none that, that their own righteousness is sufficient to save them. There's not. We have to have the righteousness of Christ, and the only way you get that is by faith in him. See, by grace you're saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is, it is faith that is in Christ and what he has done. This opens the door for you and I to receive the righteousness of Christ when we're born again. Then we no longer carry our own righteousness, we carry the righteousness of Christ. This is how we come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and help in the time of need. This is how we can enter into his presence, is pleasing God, not 
him being angry with us. Now, let me just tell you like this. Every one of you still has the old nature to contend with. Every one of you still has to fight and struggle against sin in your body. That will happen as long as you're here until, the bo until your body is changed into that one that is not going to break down anymore. That struggle, that fight, that warfare will continue. So don't be surprised by it. Don't be discouraged. Your faith is in Christ. Your trust is in him. He's the one that saves you. He is the one that justifies you. He is the one that sanctifies you. It's his word that renews your mind. Let me tell you, trust him. Put your faith and trust in him. Not in you because you're going to let you down. You're going to, you, you're going to fail. But he doesn't fail. He never fails. So put your faith and trust in him. Be quick to repent. If you sin against God, if you sin, go to him. Repent. Say, Lord, I did this. He's not surprised. He knows. Amen? But it's not good for you to try to, you know, just like run from him because there's nowhere to go. That is the most silly thing. It's like you being in a... Have, have you ever... We had like a... When I was a kid, I had like gerbils. Anybody have gerbils before? Hamsters or gerbils or something like that? You know, have a cage, right? And they're in this cage and they're locked in. And it's kind of foolish for them to run around when I come over there because they can't get away. Where are they going to go? They're in the cage. They're right here. Hey, I got you. You know, I wasn't going to harm them anyway. But the, the whole point of it is, is when you sin against God, you're running. It's like you're spending all this energy trying to run from the Lord. Where are you going? Where are you going? Just fess up to him. I messed up. He knows. He knows. But you know, when you repent, he's faithful and just to forgive you. When you confess that sin to him, he, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He loves you. He loves you. It says here, um, but the condition of mankind is pretty bad. And as you can see, this, is, this really bears out. They are all gone out of the way. They, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. This is why sometimes people say, how are you? And you say, I'm good. No, you're not. He's good. Amen. But we're not. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. He says, their throat is an open sepulcher, and, with, and their, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, before you get so, you know, get up on your soapbox and point at everybody else, he's talking about you. Amen? And see, when we look at the mirror which is the word of God. We look at the mirror. The mirror reflects our unrighteousness and our need for the Savior, our need for Jesus. We, the, the word of God reflects to us our true condition. Outside of Christ, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. But in Christ, you're a new creature. In Christ, old things are, are, are passed away. All things are become new. In Christ, you have life. In Christ, you have hope. In Christ, you have the victory. In Christ, you can be the overcomer. In Christ, you can, you can endure to the end. In Christ, you can go through all things, knowing that he is faithful and just. You can, you, you know, in Christ, that's where the answer is. Outside of Christ, it's a bad place to be. But that's where we all were. But you're not there now. You put faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. Amen? Now that Christ is your Savior, what are you supposed to do? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're supposed to walk with him. You're supposed to, you're supposed to, in your life, do those things which are good, right, and pleasing in his sight. That doesn't save you. That doesn't change you. In, in, the, in a spiritual aspect, you're born again, right? But what I'm talking about is, is that your efforts, your efforts are your necessary service. This is what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do as Christians, if that makes sense. I had to back up because I'm going too fast. Now, what, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law points to our guilt. The law shows us that we are guilty. You know, before the law was given, that time period before from the creation to, um, to the time was actually, the law was actually given, our conscience bore witness to us what was right and wrong. God gave, us the, gave the Jews the law. The law established in the law of Moses, and that's in your heart right now. That law, that law that, you know, those Ten Commandments that you saw written on stone are now written on the, on the, in your heart. You know 
what is right and what is wrong as far as that goes. You know, somebody doesn't have to come up and tell you, you know, I just want to let you know, just in case you didn't, that murder is not okay. And you're like, oh, hey, you know what? Thanks, I missed that. You didn't have to miss that because you knew that that was wrong. Your heart bears witness that that's wrong. Matter of fact, all of those things that, that are in the law based on our relationship with one another, because you know the law has this relationship towards God and this relationship towards man. Isn't that kind of neat? It looks like a cross. Anyway, the, the first commandments were towards God, our relationship with him. And the others were geared towards our relationship with one another. This is why Jesus said that, you know, the love of your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself. On, all, on those two commands, it hang all the law and the prophets. That's what he's talking about, all of that. And guess what God puts that in your heart? You know it's not right to blaspheme God's name. Should it, does it affect you when you hear somebody blaspheme his name? It, it really does. It really affects you, you know, because as a Christian, it, it should affect you because he's the one that you love. And yet you don't rise up in anger with those people. You rise up in love and explain to them the gospel, share with them the gospel message. It says here that in verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is why Christ came, right? Because the law couldn't save us. The law could tell us that we were condemned because we, were, we messed up. The law is good. The law is perfect. The law is great. And if man could only keep it, it would have been wonderful, but we couldn't. We couldn't keep it. Jesus showed us our sin in the fact that the Pharisees took pride in the fact that they were like so faithful, so religious. And yet Jesus said that if you looked on a woman and lusted after her, you've committed adultery already in your heart. So he takes the law from, from just the table of, of stone in, in conduct to your very thoughts, your very intents of your heart. See, God really looks at our innermost being, all of us. This is why we couldn't keep the law. This is why we needed grace. If we didn't have, if, if God didn't offer grace and mercy through Christ, we would all be lost. There would be no hope. And we can all agree on that, that Christ is the reason that we have life. And that's a good thing. It says here that, but now the righteousness of God without the law is, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. See, this is where I love this because he says there's no difference. Jew, Gentile, you have to put your faith in Christ. You have to come in through the door. This is for all, all mankind. Gen when we say Gentile, I'm talking about every nation under heaven other than Israel. And Israel has to come in the same way that you do, the same way. We're, we all have to come through Christ. And so the, he, he really spells it out here because in those days, in that time, there was a real differentiation. If you were Jewish, you didn't have anything to do with Gentiles. And this was, you know, Gentiles were actually considered dogs. I mean, in, that's why when the, the one woman who saying, wanted Jesus to heal uh, her daughter, Syrophoenician lady, he wanted, wanted Jesus to heal her daughter, he says it's, it's not good to give the children's bread to dogs. Now, if somebody called you a dog when you went to them for help, that would be kind of rough, right? And Jesus did that. But what was her response? Well, even the dogs eat the crumbs under their master's table. That's faith. And you know what? He responded to that. And her daughter was healed. You see, understand that, that when you come to God, you can't come to him in pride. It doesn't work. It's humility. You have to come to him humble, bearing nothing, because we have nothing. We're, without him, we're nothing. We have nothing. We have nothing to offer God but all of our being. And that we're still on the nothing scale. You know, I love the fact that, that somebody says, says this. I ask sometimes, talk to somebody, and I ask them, I said, you know, well, how are, how are you doing? And I'll hear the response, well, I'm a sinner. 
saved by grace. And I can agree with that. You know, I talked to a gentleman just the other day on the airplane, and I kind of told you guys a little bit about that, just some of you guys a little bit about that, but I talked to a gentleman. Again, God works miraculously how he puts you right where you need to be at the right time in the right place. Um, he put me, I was on a different, I was in a different seat in, in a couple hours before the flight. I happened to get internet for a minute because where we were at, there was no internet. I couldn't get access on my phone to the seat arrangements, but then we went to a, went to a restaurant and there happened to be internet where it came in. And so I, I, I turned it on and then this seat pops up and I'm like, oh wow, that's an aisle seat. I really like those because I like to be able to, you know, get up and, and walk down the aisle if, when I need to. And, um, and so I clicked on it right away and then everything else was gone. And I mean, there was a full flight, so it just disappeared. So anyway, I was like, oh, well, that's wonderful. And I get to this, get to this seat and then uh, this gentleman comes on and, and I come to find out a little later that he, he self-described himself as very cheap. He's a cheap individual. He said, I don't like to spend money. He said, he's working up on the North Slope for his family. He's gonna take that money back and reinvest in their, in their family business back in Idaho. But he said it cost $300 for him to change his flight, but he did it. Two days ago, he changed his flight to that flight because he said something was telling him he needed to be on that flight. And it was great because he sat down right next to me. I know that this something was, that was the Lord. When we started talking about Jesus, we talked for four hours on that plane. And, and truthfully, God disclosed the secrets of his heart. Like the things that he kept inside, his prayer that he kept in his mind and in his heart that he was praying up on the North Slope. I'm talking to him and in the process of talking to him, I give him the four, the four questions that he had, I gave him the answers to those questions. I didn't even know the questions. Just gave him the four, here's four things, just one after another. And he, he was absolutely blown away because he said that's, what I was praying for. That's what I was asking God about when I was up on the North Slope. You see, this gentleman had went through, he had been involved in church in his younger years, but it was a legalistic church. It was a church that if he didn't show up on, you know, on Sunday, then everybody was looking down on him. When, when the pastor or, or, the, or the deacons or elders would talk to somebody, they would talk down to people. That's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be walking in the love of Christ. We are all brothers and sisters. We have one, one shepherd, and he's the Lord. We follow him. Together, we all work together in his field for him. And so, as we continue to talk to this, this gentleman, he was amazed because I talked to him about love. God loves you. Yep, you messed up in life. We all do. We all have. But it's time to give your life to Christ. It's time to turn from your sins and trust Jesus. And you can do that right now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to postpone it. You know? And he was so excited because his wife had been um, really soured by church. She had went to an Adventist church, which you can only imagine that that's, it's a little worse. With a, it's, it's a cult, sorry. But he, he, talked, he talked to me and he says, I can't, I can't wait. I'm going to go get my, I'm going to get my wife. We're going to come over there. He's in Lewiston, Idaho, by the way. He says, we're going to come there. We're going to come visit. I want her to see a church that they're, they're doing this. They're going to come here. So we'll, we'll see Hunter. And he also pray for his wife because they want to have another baby. So, and I told him that we would keep praying for that until they had a baby. So let us know so we know when to stop. <laughs> so, because God does answer prayer, amen. And he is in charge of all that giving, giving life. So, but um, I could talk to you a long time about Hunter, but the, the point of it is, is that you don't approach people from a position of looking down. We're all on the same, we're all on the same level field. We're all sinners who need the Savior, every one of us. And when you realize that that person next to you, that person down the street, that person at the store, that person that you work with, that person that calls you up on the phone in the middle of the night wanting to sell you something that you don't need, when you realize that all of these people 
are on the same place that you are and they need Jesus, and you know what it was like when you were walking in sin with no hope, without God in the world. You know what that's like. You know what it was to walk in that, the pain and the misery of darkness, being alone and, and not having that, that assurance that everything is okay. But now in Christ you do. So show that love to them and tell them about Christ. Tell them about Jesus. Be bold with your faith and, and share the good news of the gospel because it is good news. It's the best news ever. There's no better news on the planet than to tell them about Jesus Christ. I heard a preacher say something. Well, I heard two things. And one thing I thought was really great um, that, you know, there's one preacher, one preacher said this. I wrote it down because I thought it was a good quote. He said, we deserve nothing good from God. I thought that was, that was appropriate, but he didn't finish there. He says, we deserve nothing good from God. No one does. He has every right to let us all go to hell, but grace, but grace. God gives grace. And I don't remember what the other quote was. I'll, when I remember it later, I'll tell you. But I don't remember right now. What I do remember is this. In verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, see, this is, where, this is what it's all about. It's about him, not us. Did you notice that? It's about him and not us. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that we are being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he, he not only died, but he rose again? And do you believe that he's coming back again? He is the justifier. He justifies you. He makes you right in his sight. That's good news. And this is by grace. And it's not works that you've done to do this. You don't work to give, be good enough to, so that God will eventually accept you. You got it wrong if you think that way. It's not that way. It's this way, that we were fully corrupt, that we had nothing good in us, and yet he died for us. When we were his enemy, he gave himself for us. And if we put faith and trust in him, he forgives us and justifies us in his sight. We are then held by him. What can separate you from the love of God? There's not a demon in hell that can do it. Satan would like to if he could. He'll bring, he'll bring persecution against you. He'll bring uh, storms and in, 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 he'll bring all kinds of things that he can, but he can never separate you from God's love. He, he's not that strong. Bible says that he is Jesus. He is able to keep you from falling. Trust him. Trust him. He's got you. I love that. We have a good God. His ways are always good. Our ways aren't, but his ways are. And he is merciful, and he is forgiving, and he is loving. So trust him. Turn to him. Not based on your own goodness, based on his. You understand? That when you live this life as a Christian, you're living this life because it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It's not me anymore, it's him. That's how we have to live. That's how we have to think. That's how we have to talk. It's not me anymore. It's him. Live for him. Do everything you do for Christ. Whether it's a big thing or a little thing, do it for Jesus. Amen? We were sitting in the plane. I got to tell you one more. We're sitting in the plane, and we landed a half hour early. 
We got there a half hour early. The, the plane was moving. The pilot flew great. It was the smoothest flight I've ever been on in my life. I've never been on a smoother flight. It was beautiful. We landed there a half hour early, and Hunter breathes a sigh of a relief here because he's got one more flight to get home. He says, I got one more flight, and it leaves. You know, it's boards in a half hour. And we're like, well, we have a lot of time. But you know things can change, right? And so as we sit there, we begin to sit there and sit there and sit there. And we're not at the gate yet. And the captain comes on and says, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this plane uh, that's at the gate, we thought it was going to be leaving, but unfortunately it's, it's not leaving. We have to wait for a tow crew to come and tow it to the hangar. It's not going anywhere tonight, so it's going to be a little bit. And uh, just be, please be patient. We thank you for your patience. So as we sit there, and I see him starting fidgeting in his seat, getting nervous, and I told him, it's okay, God's got you. You're, you're going to go home tonight. You're going to make it there to your family. God's got it. He says, he's going to work this out for you. And I remember sitting there as we were, we were talking, and then I stopped, and I was like, I need to pray. So I prayed, and I said, Lord, please open this up so we can get Hunter home to his family tonight. No sooner than I said that, the captain comes on. Looks like we're moving forward, folks. We're going we're gonna to get into the gate now. It was like just that fast. And I was like, thank you, Lord. That was a, I mean, that was just a prayer. I just prayed and asked him. But God answers prayer. And it works really good when you're praying for others, not your own needs. Amen? And, and it's just wonderful how God does that. And he cares. And uh, yeah. I got to exchange uh, numbers with him, and, and, uh, and I got to see him running, running off. He's a big guy, and he was running. He could be a football linebacker. He's a big guy. You'll see what I mean. But um, I was thankful to God for what he did in Hunter's life, but in my life, too, to see that God's caring hand, to see that Hunter was actually struggling up on that slope because there was so much negativity up there. It's a dark place up there, and he was struggling, and he, I mean, he was struggling, and he's questioning a lot of things, and it was wonderful to know that God had the answer for him already. You know, when he was up there on the slope asking those questions, God already arranged the answer, and I, and I thank God because God will use you as a, as a messenger. You know, God will use you that way to, to deliver his word, to deliver his, his word to somebody that's hurting, somebody that's in need, somebody that needs to be encouraged, somebody that needs to know about Jesus. Maybe a Christian that's, that's out there, you know, kind of just lost direction. God will use you at times. Be available. Be available for him. Don't keep your mouth closed, but open it boldly and speak good things that God has done. He's a good God. He loves you. Jesus is coming again. The world knows it. Do you know how the world knows that something's about to happen? Isn't it great to see that? I, I think it's great. The world, they know, they, they know something's about to happen. They don't know what. I know what's going to happen. Jesus is coming. There's going to be some dark times, though, and you know that, too, because we, we read the Scripture together. We know what's coming. This is why it's so important that in this last harvest, this last time of the harvest, that we, we get out there and bring people. There's a thing called a benchmark. Have you heard of a benchmark? You guys ever heard of a benchmark? A benchmark is like a standard. There's a standard right here. And, and that's what you base progress on. Let's say if you want to you look at... Um, the best thing is I could remind, it reminds me of it is when we lived in Okinawa and they would show, and I, I shared this before a long time ago, but that um, Armed Forces Network, they shared this picture, this commercial. It was a really cool commercial because it had, um, they showed a reef, you know, and, and fish swimming around this reef and stuff. And it was like, it was like, there was a lot of fish. It was beautiful. They said, you know, this is what we think is normal. But then they showed the next picture and said, this is what it's supposed to look like. And it was multitudes more fish and colors and, and brightness. And why was it like that? Because a lot of these, you know, these, uh, first of all, a lot of these reefs got destroyed. They do some illegal fishing out there and dynamite and stuff like that. It's not good. But they were showing what we, we perceive as normal, but what is actually normal. See, 
the world perceives that they're, they're okay, that they're normal, that everything is, you know, they're living life just how they're supposed to. But we see through the benchmark that that's not normal. It's not normal to live in rebellion against God. It's not normal to live a life in opposition to the Lord, in one that's in, in hatred. That, this is why the movies are terrible. This is why the movies are terrible today. Because movies represent death and destruction as a good thing, and that's terrible. You understand when the hero of the movie is, is, is murdering people that, you know, the, the world they applaud, they think that's a wonderful thing. It's not a wonderful thing. These people are created in the image of God. What are you talking about? The, the whole thou shalt not kill, that's a, that's a thing. Amen. You know, not to do violence to the blood of any man, that's a thing. And, and it's weird because the world is looking at things what they think is normal but it's not it's not right and the actual reality is is much different than what they think and the thing is is that christians are not immune to that we're not immune to that because the way that the church should be maybe it isn't the way the church is maybe the churches today that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof Maybe they think that's right. They have a liturgical system of government, and they come in and they, and they do all of these things, but their love for Christ is not there. You know, at the Catholic Church, they come in and they dip their hand in the water and they do the sign of the cross, and they come in and they, they, they'll sit through the Mass, and hopefully they went to com uh, confession beforehand so they could do that, you know. Right, I don't want them to do that. But, you know, what I'm saying is that, you know, they think that that's that's good that's right but it's not right mormon church they adopt a, a false uh, a false narrative you know with the book of mormon and they try to apply another testimony of jesus christ when when god clearly says in his word not to add to and take away and, and certainly not if anybody comes to preaching another gospel and that would be another gospel don't don't receive that Jehovah Witnesses, same thing, Watchtower. You know, the Watchtower, they used to think that only 144,000 were saved, would be saved. That's why they were so busy out handing out magazines, because they were trying to earn their way to heaven. You understand that that's not the right way to look at things. And in our churches today, you know, we need to walk in the love of Christ. We need to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He needs to be the passion of our life. He needs to be everything to us. He needs to be our all in all. And we need to love our neighbors ourselves. But how can the church do what the church needs to do if the church is so busy with entertainment in the world? We get so caught up with the movies and television and we sit and enjoy entertainment that blasphemes God, that does everything that God says not to do. Those, the entertainment models that are out there with the movies and television shows, they're, they're presenting rebellion against God and the church is sitting there just consuming it. How is that good? How is that right? How is that honoring God? Is that what Christ died for? To free us so that we can go and do those things which God says not to do? The Gnostics tried to do that. That's not a right thing. We're supposed to come out from among them, be separate, touch not the unclean thing. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. When we're in the world, we're ministering to the world. We're not doing the things that the world's doing. It's not okay for Christians to get out there slobbering drunk. It's not okay. It's not okay for Christians to be out there smoking pot. That's not okay. It's not okay for, for Christians, so-called Christians, to marry the same sex and say, we're Christians, we're going to church. It's not okay. We've got churches that are doing opposite of what God said, and, we're, and we think that that's okay. It's not okay. They, they think that that's normal, but they've gotten away from the benchmark. When we get away from this word of God, when we get away from the word, we're going to start doing everything that God said not to do. When we add to or we take away from the word, then we, we will do that. We will open the door and we'll find ourselves in a place that we don't want to be. Benchmark. Not legalism, just doing what's right. We're saved by grace, but we don't continue in sin so that grace may abound. We fight against it. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Fight. Fight that warfare. Your number one enemy is you. You. 
your old nature. This is why deny self, take up your cross and follow him. We have to crucify th that old nature. And that's a daily thing. And you do it through the word. When you, when you neglect the reading of the word of God and neglect prayer, then you are setting yourself up for failure. I'm going to tell you right now. If you're too busy to pray or too busy for the word, whatever you're doing, it's not more important. It's not more important. Well, you know, I got to work my job. Yeah, I, I understand that. But how long did you sleep? How long did you sit in front of your TV? How long did you get involved with things that don't matter and put aside the thing that does matter? Men, you're responsible for teaching your homes, your families. You have to teach them the word. And thank God when you do. Thank God that you're, I believe that you guys are teaching your families the word. But don't forget, it's a, it's a responsibility given to you by God to do. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. Mothers, understand Timothy heard the gospel from his grandmother and his mother. You have a responsibility to share and to teach that word of God to your children. Pray for your husband. Pray for him. And if you have family that's already gone, then I want to tell you right now, pray for others. Just keep them in prayer. Family, friends, brothers and sisters. Love one another. Love will do that. Does that make sense? Okay, we should stop here because I have a lot more, but we should stop here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness, mercy, love, kindness, and compassion towards us. We thank you that the gospel, the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it's been given to us, Lord. We, each one of us, Lord, we look to the cross. We look to the sacrifice that our Savior did. He was a propitiation for our sins. He took our sins upon himself and died on that cross, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again, conquering death in the grave and assuring to us, Lord, that you will one day raise us up. One day we'll come out of the grave. If you delay your coming, one day we'll come out of the grave. If we're alive unto your coming, Lord, we thank you that you will change us in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we look forward to that day. Either way, we look forward to seeing your face. Either way, we look forward to being with you forever. Lord, this world holds nothing for us. Although we could have all the riches of this world, they mean nothing. You are the one that means everything. And God, we'll follow you, we'll trust you, we'll walk with you all the days of our lives. Let our ways be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Help us to govern our lives according to your word, to not to stray from it. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. I ask that you give safe traveling mercies to each one tonight if they go, as they're going home. Um, if you give us opportunities to share the gospel with others out, outside before we get home, then praise the Lord, or tomorrow, Lord, if you give us tomorrow, give us an opportunity. Make that divine appointment, Lord, with someone who needs to hear about Jesus. And God, give us the boldness and the wisdom to get out there and tell them the good news. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys.